Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Give us a call. The number is 208-991-4783. And uh, become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, today's episode is brought to you by the support of our listeners. Thank you so much uh, for all of your support. And now it's time for today's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This one's called The Isabel James Matter. For your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. John Old Maynard, Johnny. Oh, hello, Mr. Maynard. Haven't talked to you in a long time. Want to go to work? Sure. What is it? We insure Miss Isabel James, Tulsa, Oklahoma. She's been killed. How? Murdered. Why, you leave as soon as you can, Johnny. Won't take me long. See you at your office in an hour, and you can fill me in on the details. We'll return to our program in just a few moments. But first, someone once said, necessity is mother of invention. In other words, every inventor feels that there is a definite need for whatever he invents. It may be as large as a battleship or as small as a pin. But someone, somewhere, will find a use for it. And just to make sure that no one tries to cash in on his invention, every inventor carefully takes out a patent or a copyright on whatever it is that he has invented. Where does he go to get his patent or copyright? Probably to the Department of Commerce, since that is the prime concern of the department. For example, suppose you invent a a widget with two handles instead of one. Well, this means, of course, a big boon to widget users because it can now be operated by left-handed as well as right-handed people. Having invented a two-handled widget, you and your inventive genius should be protected. So you contact the Commerce Department and apply for a patent. The department also registers the trademarks and labels you use in selling two-handled widgets so that no one else can claim he invented the two-handled widget and collect the money that should be rightfully yours when you make and sell your particular type of widget. Now, suppose you also write a book on the history of the two-handled widget or a song titled The Love Song of the Two-Handled Widget. You take them to the Department of Commerce and have them copyrighted. This way, you can always prove that the book and the song are your property. So if some foreign inventor suddenly appears with the startling announcement that his country claims the honor of having invented the two-handled widget, or the one-wheel doohickey, you can prove he is mistaken by producing the prior patent you have registered with the United States Department of Commerce. Defense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, National Life and Casualty Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Isabel James matter. Expense account item one, $103.65, plane fare and incidentals between Hartford and Tulsa, Oklahoma, after receiving from you the necessary information concerning the case. I arrived in Tulsa the next morning, registered at the hotel... I went directly to the police station where I introduced myself to Captain Clifford Kittig. Yeah, got a teletype from your company. Said you'd be in this morning. Good trip? Fine. You're investigating the Isabel James murder. That's right. I was hoping you'd give me some help. I'd sure like to, but it got us some. We've had three others like this already. Three others? Yeah. All the same. Isabel James was the fourth. Looks like Tulsa's got a Jack the Ripper. All with their throats cut? Yeah, four killings in the last three weeks. 
You're after a madman. Yeah. Pretty smart madman. Haven't got a lead. Not a one? Always picked a lonely spot, never a witness, never anyone who saw anything or heard anything. What's the use of the knife? The lab thinks it's a razor. Straight razor. Got the town a little jumpy. I can understand. But we'll get something. Sooner or later, the killer will make a slip or somebody will tell us something. What happens in the meantime? We just got to pray there ain't no more killing. Mm. How far is Dawson from Tulsa? Not very far. Going over to see the dead girl's uncle. Yeah, he's the beneficiary. Mm-hmm. I found the policy in her belongings. I was the one notified your company. Do you know the uncle? Had him come down and identify the body. Hey. How much does he get? Ten thousand. Well, he can use it. Just an old farmer. Well, I'm going to run over and see him. All right. Hey, so, how long are you going to be in town? Well, I'm being paid to investigate a murder. I guess I'll be around until somebody catches a killer. Captain Kissick advised me where I could rent a car, and a half hour later I was driving a small coupe out of the Tulsa city limits heading for Dawson. The dead girl's uncle, Morley Parrish, lived a few miles east of Dawson in an old run-down farmhouse that was in the middle of six or eight acres of parched earth. He was a man in his late fifties, weather-worn and thin. He met me at the door with a look of suspicion. What do you want? Mr. Parrish? Yes? My name is Dollar. I represent the insurance company that covered your niece's life. I'd like to talk to you about it. About what? About your niece. Her death. She's dead. What's there to talk about? You're the beneficiary. You get $10,000 from the insurance company. Come in. Sit down. Uh, I get, um... How much you say? Ten thousand dollars. You want a drink? Well, I don't. I got a jug of whiskey. I've been saving it. <laughs> you say your name is um, Dollar. What company you work for? National Life and Casualty. I get ten thousand dollars. That's right. Yeah, I have a swig. <laughs> Oh, my, you swallowed wrong, huh? Yeah. Oh, well, give me that. Ah. Ah. Well, no wonder. I didn't shake it up. Shake it up? Oh, I sure. <laughs> Gotta shake it to make it smooth. <laughs> you sure that didn't come with a fuse in it? Emmett Willis made it himself. Run it by last month. Here, you try it now. Well, I really don't think... Oh, I'm... go ahead. You got a bad sample. Okay. You see how much smoother it is? Ah, yeah. <laughs> well, you just got to shake it up. No, I'll have it. Ah, yes. Oh, my. Well, that's right tasty. Yeah. <sighs> Let's talk about your knee. Huh? All right. Let's talk. You know why anybody would want to kill her? No, oh, Tad Pollard's been killing all them other girls, ain't it? Yeah, I guess so. That's what the police say. Well, it seems to me he don't care who he kills. Just as long as it's a girl. <laughs> Another twig? No, no, thanks. Your niece left you when she was 16, didn't she? Yeah, I'll take my niece. She you ain't it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 17. 17, I <laughs> She ran off the coast. You see her much after yeah. that? Not much. Maybe once, twice, yeah. When was the last time you saw her? Uh, the other day in the morgue. No, I mean before that. <laughs> Oh, my. Well, that was about a month. She didn't write or... Oh, look, Mr. Police, they ask all them questions. I know it. You could ask them all over again, huh? If you want to get your $10,000. <laughs> well, okay. No, she didn't write. She never wrote. At least in the last five, six years, she never wrote. <laughs> when she first got to Tulsa, she used to write now and then. Last time I seen her, she didn't say nothing about what she was doing or who she was seeing. Her. So I can't very well help you find out who killed her. <laughs> Come on, have a swig. No, thanks. I'm in a rented car. You can see yourself. And once I open the jug, it gets finished. Then you better finish it. <laughs> Naturally, I will. Oh, 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 man, oh, man. Delicious, huh? Oh, you bet. I left before he finished the damage on. It was getting dark, and he stood on the porch, leaning against the post and waving goodbye between the last few swallows. 
Back in Tulsa, I went to the hotel where I took a hot shower and then stretched out in the bed to relax for a few minutes before going out to dinner. I smoked a few cigarettes and I just about decided to have some food sent up to the room when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. This is Cliff. Huh? Captain Kissick. Oh, hi. Got back from Dawson about 40 minutes ago. What did you think of the old boy? Quite a character. Son, if you weren't doing anything, you might like to drop down to the station. You got something? Yeah, just picked up a suspect. Might be our man. What makes you think so? He was following a girl. She spotted him and got worried. We got too close, she began screaming, and he ran. She gave us a pretty good description, and about 15 minutes ago, a couple of the boys picked him up. The girl identify him? Yeah, that he was the one who followed her all right. Well, it seems to me you're going to need more than that. Well, we might have it. When the boys searched him, they found a straight razor in his pocket. Coming down? Right away. His name's Story. S-T-O-R-E-Y. Alvin Story. He hasn't said anything interesting. But you think he's this? Yeah, I think so. Nothing definite except the razor and his actions, but I just got a hunch. What's he say about the razor? Not much. Admits it is. Says he was just carrying it. Mm-hmm. You were just taking a walk. Yes, sir, that's right. I was just taking a walk. And you weren't following the girl. I told you I wasn't. I told you I was just taking a walk. The girl thought I was following her. Well, I can't help that. I wasn't. I was just taking a walk, like I said in the first place. Hello, Captain. Hello, Alvin. Back with someone to release Sergeant Herrick? I'm not tired, Alvin. Well, you're going to be if you keep on like this, because I've told you the truth, and I'll just keep right on telling it. All night, if you keep asking me. Have a cigarette, Alvin? I told you I don't smoke. Honest, Captain, this is just a waste of time. I've told you the truth, and you're just a waste of your time with all these questions. We've got a lot of time. Now, let's go through it again, Alvin. Where did you get the razor? Why bother? Where? At a hardware store. You can check it. I bought it at a hardware store about three weeks ago. I used it to shave with. Not to kill anyone. Honestly, I didn't kill anyone. I'm not the one you want. I'm not that person that killed all those women. We never said you were, Alvin. But you think so? Just because that girl thought I was following her. Who no, weren't you? Well, no. I told you I was not following that girl. You were on your way home. Yes. You told me before. That I was on the way to a show. Yes. I wasn't on the way home. Keep asking me all these questions. I get confused. I made a mistake. What show were you going to see? Well... What show? Oh, no one in particular. I was just going downtown to see what was playing. You were headed downtown? Yes, yeah, to see what was playing at the shows. The girl says you were following her. Well, I don't care what the girl says. She's lying. I wasn't following her. But you were walking behind her. Yes, I... I might... Yes, I was probably walking behind her. Well, she was going in the other direction from town. Well, again, I wasn't behind her. I tell you, I was going... Police Sergeant named Haddock kept working on the suspect. Quietly and persistently. Alvin Story, a tall, frail-looking man, dressed in blue jeans and a leather jacket, sat behind the table trying desperately to be calm and anticipate the sergeant's next question. After half an hour, the captain and I left and went upstairs to his office where he fixed coffee. Cream and sugar? Black will be fine. Well, yeah. what do you think? I don't know. He's a strange one. Mm. If I had to pick types, I don't know. Hard to tell about anybody in a police station. Maybe he was following the girl. He starts screaming her lungs out and he panics. The law picks him up, finds a razor on him. Maybe he's not the killer at all. He knows he looks guilty, so he gets good and scared. Mm. Guys act awful funny and make a lot of mistakes when they're scared. He just carries a razor around with him. Well, isn't it possible? Oh, yes. Yeah. But I still think he's our killer. Well, I have to admit I'm inclined to agree with you. But there's always a chance he's not. You never know. Kissing. Yeah? Okay. So we know now. Sorry? Yeah. He just confessed.
know, many great men have attained the highest office in our land, the presidency of the United States. Can you guess the name of this man? He never wanted to be president, since he personally felt he was unqualified for the office. When he was only 30 years old, he was appointed member of the Ohio Superior Court. He was President Grant's Secretary of War and Attorney General. In 1908, through the recommendation and support of Theodore Roosevelt, he succeeded Roosevelt as president. If you don't have his name by now, here's another clue. During his administration, the Postal Savings Plan and Parcel Post were established. Who was he? William Howard Taft, 27th President of the United States. His life is part of your American heritage. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Alvin Story still sat at the table in the dim, bare little room. He looked tired, but he looked relieved. A stenographer was set up at one end of the table, while Sergeant Haddock leaned against the wall and smoked a cigarette. Captain Kissig crossed to the table and sat on the edge of it, facing the suspect. Can we get this thing over with, Captain? Can we finish it up and let me go lie down? The stenographer's ready. Tell him, Sergeant. Well, what's there to tell? I killed him. I killed all of them. Isn't that enough to say? That's... What they'll hang me for or anything else I say won't make any difference. Why'd you kill him, Alvin? I don't know. Do you know something? I really don't know. I I just wanted to. First one. I saw her and I just wanted to. I, I guess I thought about it before I saw her. Yes, I, I, I used to lie in bed and think about it. I used to dream about it, too. I used to wake up and feel like I'd really done it. Sick all over me. I'm scared. I felt so terrible. All I, I feel now, kind of. Yeah. It's like a dream now. Right now, it's like a dream. But it isn't. Tell us about the person. Do I have to? It'll help. Kind of hard to remember exactly. I bought the razor and I waited for it. On Garvey Boulevard? I guess so. Try to remember. Yeah, it, it was Garvey. It was late at night. What night? The night of the 11th? Maybe. I, I think so. I, I think it was Tuesday night. That's right. And I killed her. You knew her? No, not really. It's hard to explain. Well, did you know any of the other three girls? Two. No, who was the last one? It makes four all together. No, three. Now, think about it a minute, Alvin. There, there were... Only three. I ought to know. Three girls. No, now, now, try to remember, Alvin. I don't have to try and remember anything. There were three. Just three. One, two, three. I know. Why would I want to lie? I'm not saying you're lying, Alvin. I, I, I even know the names. I cut the pictures out of the papers. Tell me the names, then, Alvin. Well, certainly. Mary Knapp, Virginia Vitello, and Thelma Greer. I know all of them. I, I kept a record. What about Isabel James? Who? Isabel James? Oh, yes. She was in the papers the other day. That's right. And somebody killed her like the others. I read about it. I thought it'd be blamed on me, but it didn't make any difference. One or ten, what difference would it make? <laughs> half hour they questioned Alvin's story. Time and time again he admitted the three killings, and time and time again he denied any connection with the fourth, the murder of Isabel James. <laughs> Expense account item two, four dollars and ninety-five cents, breakfast for Captain Kissing and myself, after which I returned to the hotel and crawled into bed. A lie detector test would be given to Alvin sometime late in the afternoon, so that gave me at least six or seven hours to catch up on my sleep. I left the call at the desk, turned over, and closed my eyes. Study, Dollar. Three o'clock, Mr. Dollar. 
Oh, uh huh, thanks. And Mr. Parrish has been waiting in the lobby to see you. Parrish? Yes, sir. Mr. Morley Parrish. He's been waiting over an hour. Okay. Send him up. Yes, sir. Come here, Mr. Perry. Have a seat. Thank you. I've been waiting downstairs for over an hour. No, I'm sorry. But I was up all night. I told the desk not to disturb me until three. Oh, gee, that's all right. I know you city fellas don't like to get to bed much before the sun comes up. <laughs> I didn't mind waiting. I was with the police. Oh? I've been working with her on the death of your niece. Oh, is that right? Well, uh, that's the reason I come to Tulsa to see you. I was wondering when I was going to get to... Get the money. Well, see, I got a chance to get me a right smart section of land. Trading the place I got now, plus a thousand for you, goodbye. Oh? Well, Mr. Parrish, it might be some time before you get the money. Oh, how come? Oh, there's a routine that has to be followed. I have to finish my investigation. You're still investigating? Oh, sure. You see, your niece's death is still unsolved. Well, if that fellow's killing all them other girls... It certainly looks that way. You mean you got to catch him before you can pay me? No, but I've got to make sure that he's the one who killed your niece. You think maybe he isn't? Well, to tell you the truth, Mr. Perry... Well, she got killed just like all them other girls. Not exactly. Huh? I said not exactly. You see, the razor that kills your niece and the razor that killed the other girls aren't the same. Well, how do you know that? The police laboratory report. They can tell if it was a different razor? Oh, no. Come on, Mr. Donner. Maybe I ain't the brightest. It's a fact, you. Mr. Parrish. How do you think they knew it was a razor in the first place? Not just a very sharp knife. Oh, they can tell, all right. Well, maybe the killer ain't using the same razor. Yeah, we've considered that, but we can't tell. He hasn't killed again. Maybe he never will. You mean I might never get my money? Well, now, Mr. Parrish, it's not quite that bad. I want to see you get your money. You certainly got it coming. But I can't honestly recommend payment to my company until the case is solved. Well, you mean until you catch the killer? That, or until we're certain the same man that killed the others killed your niece. Well, it seems to me you got to catch him to prove that. Yeah, unless he kills again with the same razor he used on your niece. Then we can be pretty sure that he's changed razors. Well, maybe he's got uh, two different ones. Mm, maybe. Mm. Well. You have to go? Yeah, i got to be getting back. As long as I ain't gonna get the money right away, there's no sense in hanging around. Don't be discouraged, Mr. Parrish. Just as soon as I'm convinced the killer's changed razors, you'll get your money. Yeah, Dollar, we just came through the polygraph test. According to our experts, Story killed all the girls except Isabel Jane. Look, Captain. Morley Parrish was just in my room. I gave him a cock and bull story about his niece being killed with a different razor. A different razor? I think maybe he did it for the insurance. Read all the stories in the paper about the killings and decided to kill his niece. And then everybody just chalk it all up to Alvin Story. Right. Only I didn't tell him that Alvin Story had been arrested. Explain about that different razor. Parrish left here thinking he wasn't going to get the 10000 until I was certain the same man killed his niece to kill the others. He thinks your police lab proved that Isabel James was killed with another razor. And he quickly came up with a solution that the killer had changed razors or had two of them. So what? I think he'll go out and prove it. What? You mean you think... I think he's simple-minded enough to try and kill someone just to make it look like the killer has changed razors. Well, I sure hope you're wrong. Well, so do I, but it's the only way we could prove anything. Where is he? He just left. But holy cow, if you're right and he's wandering around... Look. Relax. He'll go back to his farm in Dawson first. What makes you think so? He has to get the razor, doesn't he? Ten minutes later, Captain Kissig picked me up in his car, and we drove well over the speed limit getting to Dawson. Just west of old Morley's farm, we pulled off the road and turned off our lights. Well, the house is dark. Where is he? Still on his way from Tulsa. We got here pretty fast, Captain. Yeah, we did, didn't we? Come on. Let's walk down to the house. Do you have a car? I don't know, but I doubt it. 
I didn't see one the last time I was here. Dollar? Hmm? What if you're wrong? What if you guessed wrong? What if he did have the razor on? Well, that's a pretty good question. Moon. We walked down to the old farmhouse while a coyote howled way off in the distance. We found a spot by the side of the house where we could see the road and still be hidden in the shadows. We waited for Morley Parrish to come and get his razor. Mr. Parrish. Mr. Dollar? Yeah. This is Captain Kissig with me. Who do I? Just came down to see you. Well, I've got business. i got to be going. In a minute. Yeah, there's a drink in the house, another jug behind the stove. Go on in and make yourself comfortable. <laughs> I'll be right back. Hey, just a minute, Mr. Well, Parrish. i got to hurry. Where are you going? i got business here in Dawson. You going to walk? Oh, sure. I always walk. <laughs> I hitchhike if I get a lift. We've got a car. We'll give you a lift. No, I don't want to put you in no trouble. No trouble. Mr. Parrish, what did you pick up in the house? Huh? What a nothing. Uh, what have you got in your pocket? One nothing. Uh, no, what do you want? You ain't got no right to do... You own a straight razor, Mr. Parrish? You better give it to us, Mr. Parrish. And be careful how you do it. I've got a gun pointed at you. We knew it all the time, huh? I had a hunch. Um, now here you are. Mm. Is this the one you killed your niece with? Yeah. You were going to kill somebody else? Oh, there ain't no difference after the first one. And I sure could have used that money. Gee. Man, oh man, that was a wonderful little farm, but I... Oh... I just guess you can't beat them scientific police methods. <laughs> you sure thought I had it all figured out, too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You gonna go now? Yeah. What's gonna happen to my farm? They'll sure hang me, and I ain't got no relatives the to take will take care of it. Come on. Mm-hmm. Mr. Darling. Hmm? Why don't you just sneak back to the and get that jug? No sense in wasting on some stranger who wouldn't appreciate it. We took old Morley Parrish back to the station where he gave us a complete confession. He killed his niece for the insurance the way I figured. When we told him that Alvin's story had confessed that afternoon, old Morley just shook his head and said something about policemen being a whole lot smarter than most folks give him credit for. Expense account item three, $11.80, dinner for me and Captain Kissick. After which I returned to my hotel, turned in and got a good night's sleep. Expense account items four and five, $89.45, car rental and hotel bill. Item six, $125.19, plane fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $335.04. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar. <laughs> stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Joe Duvall, Parley Bear, Howard McNear, and Clayton Polk. Welcome back. Well, Johnny Dollar can tend to play some uh, very dangerous games with uh, murderers and potential murderers. And uh, it doesn't... Uh, 
get much more dangerous than this particular episode. Uh, but uh, I guess all's well that ends well. Uh, so, all right. Well, we do have actually a few listener comments and feedback. Uh, and we will go ahead and we'll start out with a correction from Kelly, who writes, uh, Hi, Adam. I noticed in your commentary after the May 11th, 2012, uh, Johnny Dollar episode that you mentioned Jack Mo- Moyles as the star of Rocky Fortune. Actually, Frank Sinatra starred in Rocky Fortune. Jack Moyle starred in Rocky Jordan. I only noticed this because Rocky Jordan is one of my favorite old-time radio shows of all time. I believe it is on your list eventually to air, so I can't wait. Boston Blackie is uh, one of my other favorites, which I believe is also on your list. Well, thanks so much, uh, Kelly, for the clarification. And I mixed up the two Rocky shows, um, of course, Rocky Jordan is uh, Jack Moyles, and Rocky Fortune is uh, Frank Sinatra. And thanks so much for the clarification. I guess I was thinking about Rocky Fortune because I li- answered a listener question on Twitter about uh, that. Then we have a few comments on Facebook. Um, of all the actors uh, that portrayed, uh, portrayed your truly Johnny Dollar, Bob da- Bailey is the best. And uh, additional comments on that. Uh, I actually got quite a few. Uh, uh, Sean says, I love yours truly, Johnny Dollar, especially with Bob Bailey. And Thaddeus says, I love these uh, old Johnny Dollar shows. And uh, Dave says, been listening to all the yours truly, Johnny Dollar shows on my iPod from your podcast. And really like Charles Russell's portrayal of Johnny Dollar, but Bob Bailey is still my favorite. Well, uh, thanks so much. Uh, I, I'm glad, uh, first of all, we enjoyed the Russell portrayal. It's it's interesting to hear the actors before uh, Bailey, and you know the show had quite a history. You know before you know before Bob Bailey had outlasted uh, some of the other shows that were on the air. It's amazing to think that there were more episodes of Johnny Dollar recorded before Bob Bailey uh, than there were episodes of Philip Marlowe. But we are actually getting pretty close to the Bailey point. I think we're uh, probably less than a year uh, into uh, finishing up the uh, John Lunn episodes and getting down with Let George do it and then getting to hear Bob Bailey in uh, Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. So uh, it's going to be, I, I think, uh, definitely interesting, and I uh, can hardly wait. Uh, we do have uh, one other listener comment before we go, uh, and uh, this one comes from Melissa, who says, My entire family enjoys listening to old-time radio. Uh, thanks uh, so much for your podcast. And actually, uh, False Alarm had two more comments on Podcast Alley. Uh, which we haven't gotten a comment in a while because I haven't been promoting because there's still issues with the site working for voting. But uh, um, love your podcast, uh, comments one listener, and Adam Graham has the best uh, possible for great or TR. Thank you for your dedication and work to keep Old Time Radio live from Kelly. Well, thanks so much to Kelly and to everyone else for your kind comments. That will actually do it for this week. Um, well, uh, we will see you on Monday with Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. Then on Tuesday, we're starting into Pete Kelly's Blues with Jack Webb. And then join us back on Friday for yours truly, Johnny Dollar. In the meanwhile, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And give us a call. The number is 208-991-4783. And uh, become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.